All right. We are live and uh, welcome to another episode, the third episode of how we would build this on uh, Launchpad TV. Um, I'm Chris Schultz. Hey, and I'm Ryan Wigginist. And uh, it's awesome to be back with, uh, with everybody. We've got a great guest, Eric Marcoulier, who will be joining us in a few minutes today. Um, I have a, uh, a breezy environment that I'm coming to you from today. I'm uh, in Mexico and uh, have been doing a little uh, digital nomad uh, trip during February and down here. So um, glad to be coming to you from here. Ryan, you're, you're in a more of a wintry environment today, I guess. Yeah, we're we're playing polar polar opposites today, man. We're I'm in Nashville, but um, we've had our we've had every five years we have like a, a blizzardy ish day, and so and so the last couple of days has been that for us. But it's been pretty funny. The whole city's kind of been shutting down, and you know, people in the south when snow hits, they kind of freak out. So plenty of plenty of memes on the internet of of southern guys and their trucks sliding down icy roads. If you want to Google that. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure there's uh, there's some cars, cars, you know, cars on the side of the road at this point. Of course, Eric from Boulder uh, knows how to knows how to drive in snow. I'm assuming um, we'll chat with him in a few minutes here. Um, but Ryan, what's on your mind uh, in the in the startup world in the um, you know building products world? Um, we're seeing a lot of stuff. I, I'm seeing a lot of stuff. I wanted to ask you about. Um, you know, Eric is doing a lot of coaching right now. Um, mm -hmm. I'm seeing a lot of activity in sort of the, the coaching space right now, including people building products and sort of platforming in that space. Yeah, I think I think the industry is ready for. Well, I don't know. It's interesting. I've been thinking a lot about it. You know, we've talked about it. We have I got a friend that's also um, building something really interesting. We might have him on a future show, but it's I think it's really about streamlining the I know this is like maybe cliche, but really streamlining the experience the experience in a sense. And I think the online coaching world was so kind of stuck in the course. I don't want to say stuck. I think we're still early on for like course building in a sense and online education. But, um, you know, I don't know, depending on, depending on how long the, the, the kind of remote work, um, uh, continues, there's going to definitely need me space for kind of like streamlining the experience of helping somebody get from point A to point B. So I don't know. I, I'm pretty excited. It's interesting. I was going to bring this up. I'm glad you brought it up. Is that, um, in 2002, I joined, a lot of people don't know this, but I joined the military and uh, it feels like a completely different life ago. So, so 20, 20 years ago, I don't really recognize myself in a sense, but it was interesting during the first four years of kind of the, um, the, the uh, we might call it, some might call it the invasion, <laughs> right? Or the, the Iraq Afghanistan war, we actually created like nine years of, of medicine, meaning uh, because of the amount of injuries that were happening during that time, time sped up. So they had to invent things really quickly to kind of fit what was happening in the war. There's a really cool documentary on it. You can go and look at it. It's about just how fast these wartime situations create innovation. So it's interesting. I think with COVID, it kind of feels like there's like nine or 10 years of innovation happening in nine or 10 months. So um, I'll be curious to see what kind of pops out in 2022, 2023. But yeah, that's what, I, that's what I've been kind of looking at and feeling. So I'll be curious so to see what Eric Eric seems like it, on his side. It is sort of interesting. The you know we've we've obviously you know had a cycle where you have some you know disintermediation, like say of office space and co working. In in some ways, um, more and more types of companies, uh, startups are being built now. A lot of remote first cultures. Um, mm. so the the maybe the typical um, you know corporate enterprise, you know, raise, you know, raise a ton of money, you're in Silicon Valley, and you're meeting with your manager, your mentor, you're doing the one on ones, maybe some of that is being disintermediated now. And some of the um, development work, some of the accountability, some of the some of the guidance may not come from, you know, board meetings, or, or, you know, sessions with your manager, but they're now coming from like an outside party. Um, so it's sort of interesting, interesting what's going on right now. Yeah. You know, cause I think in the coaching world, we only, uh, we'll talk to Eric about this, but I think it's interesting. We, I think that's the language we know how to use for kind of that space right now, but essentially I think what I loved about what, what, what I loved about COVID <laughs> for, for kind of what it's done for the tech space is actually caused people to ask for help. Um, and I think that's just what, what kind of some of that coaching is like, Hey, I, I'm, I need help. 
And I think I think just even in uh, the startup space for founders, it's been my experience. Well, uh, even with VCs, like those those four letters <laughs> are are tough to come out of our mouth sometimes. Um, so I actually love I actually love it's one of the things I've like worked on a lot in my life is like just just say those four letters and see what happens. So I don't know. I think I think that's what the coaching is. I think it's it gives us language to be able to do that without having to actually do that. So um, yeah, man, I just help. <laughs> We could, we could all use some help. That's that's for sure. <laughs> Eric, help us. <laughs> help us. All right. Well, speaking of Eric, let's go ahead and bring him in. Um, I'm going to bring you in, Eric, and uh, and give you an intro. Um, uh, interestingly, uh, Lauren, uh, who is helping to produce us with Flatstack, um, dug up an old tweet, Eric, and uh, we did a session like this back at Tulane University. Um, more than 10 years ago. That was in, in 2009, the last time we did uh, we did a session. Obviously, that was in real life uh, at the business school at the MBA program at Tulane. Um, but great to be doing it virtually with you again. But Eric is a longtime, uh, longtime luminary in the tech world, uh, founder of my <laughs> blog log, IGN, GNIP, um, strategic advisor. I'm not even sure quite what your role was ultimately in Beatport, but Beatport, a lot of successes. And now um, you are uh, sort of available for coaching, like we're talking about, and uh, advisory work and working with a number of different startups. So, Eric, welcome. Guys, it's great to be here. Thank you so much. I, I will say I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed, I guess, to hear all this talk of coaching because I thought you were going to have me on to talk about my new one man play. I'm a dog and you are too. But <laughs> we'll Dude, talk about coaching. We're, we're, Chris and I are totally down to scratch this whole thing and go straight to the dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. No, coach, coaching is good. I, uh, I'm enjoying it. So, so I think this, we, we were doing this a year, a year and a half ago. We were, we were sitting around Eric's dinner table. I had just met Eric for the first time and I think he cooked us some brilliant burgers on that on that on that boulder home out looking uh i don't know what that was what mountain that was but it was okay oh that's it eric come on i mean it's not chris's view i'm sure but uh it uh it, it does well enough it serves <laughs> oh get out of here chris take your surfboard and go to the beach <laughs> <laughs> Why are you talking to us? Well, I just remember Eric, you you have you spent many many years sort of in between, you know, or, or during, but you're remote. You were spending a lot of time surfing down in Florida, so I'm following your footsteps. You know, getting catching some waves in Mexico these days. Outstanding. I've been enjoying seeing the uh, pictures of you surfing lately. So that is a again. If there's one thing that uh, I'm uh, happy about with COVID, it's that people are maybe striving for a little bit more work-life balance. Not always finding it, but uh, but there's some people on Walkabout who are having pretty good lives right now. Yeah, come on, man. So what are we going to talk about, guys? What, uh, what's, what's, how would we build what? <laughs> uh, everything. Okay, so we have this thing on how we would build this, or how would Eric build this? This will be this episode, right? Uh, and, and, and it starts like this. Eric, without, like, take a big, deep breath. I'm going to ask you a question. Ready? Hmm. Tell us a story. So, long time ago. No. Um, tell you guys a story. Yeah. Uh, I any story? Yep. All right. I'm gonna tell you guys um how luck plays into success mm. more than anyone ever wants to admit. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. That's a really good one. Yeah. Um, so, uh, first of all, I will turn this around. That awesome painting, you guys might remember it. It's not the easiest thing to see in this light, but it says BPM 140. And uh, my, uh, my friend Sandro Chigavani uh, used to be known as Miss One back in the day. It was a world, world renowned tagger. And he designed that for me. I could have had it say anything I wanted. And I had it say BPM 140. So many years ago, back in 1993, read issue number five of Wired Magazine and decided that all I wanted to do was 
be a part of the, the very fledgling internet, uh, consumer internet, and uh, and uh, specifically the World Wide Web. And over the next year and a half, I worked on a bunch of small projects. I immediately found uh, the University of Florida, where I eventually dropped out of, um, had this uh, groundbreaking interactive media lab, and I, I basically uh, walked in and was like, I'll just be some graduate student slave. I just want to learn. And by the following summer, by I guess summer of 95, uh, myself and a couple of grad students had been trying to uh, build a, uh, a, a um, what do you call it, a media company, sort of like uh, Razorfish back in the day. And so I had uh, in July of 95 bought issue number one of The Net magazine. And I promise this is all going to come together. Um, Net Magazine was kind of like a grunge version of Wired Magazine. And this was long enough ago. You guys might remember this. Chris certainly will. This was back in the era of cover-mounted media. Floppy disks eventually you know, uh, were, uh, were followed by CD-ROMs. This was a three-and-a-half-inch floppy that was mounted to the uh, cover of this magazine. Honestly, it's the only reason that I bought it because I thought it was amazing. And took it home, devoured the magazine. It was very cool. And I put the floppy disk in my 386 computer, maybe it was 46 at that point. And it was it was a whole bunch of locally run web pages off of this floppy disk, and it wasn't great at all. And so I ended up uh, sending an email at like five in the morning. Hey, editor in chief, congrats on the launch of this new magazine. It's fantastic. Uh, you know, devoured your uh, the entire thing, put the floppy disk in, was was slightly disappointed at the quality. And, you know, that's important for your brand. And I'd love to help. I run this consulting company and, you know, run this consulting company in Florida. Um, I'd, love to, I'd love to help. And so uh, the next morning, like, I swear to God, not like five hours, six hours later, editor-in-chief comes into the Burlingame office in the Bay Area, pulls up his, uh, his email and sees some random dude in Florida suggesting that he's going to tell him how to, you know, internet. And he's like, yeah, fuck that. Like, really? Seriously? I'm in Silicon Valley. Like, I, I know the internet. But he still, for reasons that I'll never understand, punted it to Chris Anderson, the guy that owns TED now, and at the time owned this publishing company, who then punted it back down to this, uh, this British guy, Jonathan Simpson Bent, that was the publisher for a couple of video games magazines. And now it's, I don't know, noon my time so we're talking six or seven hours round trip and this british guy calls me up out of nowhere and says hey i got forwarded that email that uh that, that you sent this morning i published these other video game magazines would love to talk to you about internet stuff by the way uh you must be a fan of the omni trio <laughs> why did johnny know that i might be a fan of the omni trio well a couple years prior, I bought my first uh, dance music compilation called Speed Limit, 140 BPM plus. And it was all jungle and breakbeat and, and drum and bass. And when I went to the University of Florida and I had to uh, sign up for an email address, I said 140 BPM and they're like, no, sorry, it's got to start with a letter. So I flipped it and said BPM 140. And so the email that I sent to the magazine that got forwarded to Jonathan was BPM 140 at ufl.edu. And so Jonathan's like, you must be a fan of this, of this, of this band, the Omni Trio. I might have been the only person in Florida <laughs> that knew the Omni Trio, and I loved them. Wow. And we were freaking out and talking about dance music for an hour. <laughs> and at the end of that call, he's like, you sound like a decent guy. Uh, would you mind if I fly you out to San Francisco next week and we talk about uh, getting my magazines online? Three weeks later, I dropped out of college and was – uh, taking my stuff in a U-Haul across the across the country, building those initial websites turned into launching IGN with him. Uh, you know, a year later, uh, he was the guy that said, "Let's go, you know, sell uh, advertising on other people's websites." IGN was originally the Imagine Games Network. I was the guy who was like, "We need to stop just building websites for our internal brands. We need an entirely new web-based brand." And together, we launched it. And Johnny's one of my very best friends, and we've had long conversations about this. The only reason that he reached out to me 
was my email address. The only reason that I had that email address was because of a CD that I bought three years prior. I never could have optimized for that, ever. Random occurrences. Like I could have bought the next CD in the, uh, in the stack, in which case, who knows, maybe my email was, would have been like, you know, I, I can't even give you a good example. Um, hardcore at UFL.edu. <laughs> Probably because I, I liked Hardcore Heroes as well. Um, in that case, IGN wouldn't exist. IGN wow. wouldn't have been public. IGN wouldn't have employed hundreds of people and, and eventually got sold for $650 million to Fox Interactive. None of that happens without me walking into a Target Records at you know three in the morning one, one day or one evening and buying a random CD. That is what day-to-day -day contributes to our successes. And I sort of feel like anybody who's like, oh, I just did this all on my own and I'm solely responsible for, for, you know, for building this thing. It's like, motherfucker, you have no clue. <laughs> like a, a whole series of things that you never were in control of happened. And I am happy that you are smart and you're a hustler and you did all of these things, but don't ever assume that you made this happen. Like life happened to you and you caught it and you held on. And I think that's really important when you're in an industry like this for nearly 30 years like I've been. And Christ, the number of people that I've had dinner with that are billionaires, right? It's, it's a couple dozen at this point. And it's really easy to, in certain times, be like, why, you know, why are they so successful, right? What did they do right that I did wrong? And it's really important to recognize that I'm probably just as smart as them. I work just as hard as them and the right things happen to them that didn't necessarily happen to me. And I better just fucking love what I'm doing because success is not guaranteed. Wow. Oh, Eric. Oh, Eric. That's a, that's a great story, Eric. And, and interesting to hear, you know, it sort of combines, you know, the, uh, the, the meaning and the, you know, the, the serendipity as Graham, uh, you know, just pointed out. Uh, but also I love origin stories, right? The, the first story, the, the way you get into an industry, the way you start your career always is just, you know, it's so interesting to, you know, sort of reflect on. Um, so, so you know, thinking about that and applying it to a, a would-be founder or somebody sort of early in their career, um, you know, would you would you say is Oleg saying you know sit back and wait to be lucky or you know there is some there's some uh, you know there, there's definitely I, I some kernels in there and I'm interested to hear what hear Ryan picked out or er, Eric what you think but I heard. Um, a clear lack of imposter syndrome because here you are, a college kid, you know, saying I can I can do websites better than Silicon Valley. You know, sending an email off to an editor in chief. So you get over your imposter syndrome real fast with with you know making moves like that. Um, you know, and and you know being willing to you know sort of I forget what the saying is, but you know essentially you know, preparedness when luck strikes, right? He said, he said, yeah, come on, let's do this. Let's have a, you know, hour long talk. And, you know, a, a, you know, a week later, you're in a U-Haul heading for San Francisco. That means you were, you were ready to pull the trigger and, and, uh, and take a big risk there. Absolutely. Right. I mean, there's, um, that story encapsulates a lot of things as, as many of what you pulled out. Um, I do not ever want to suggest that you can just sit back and let luck happen to you. Um, the, the, there's a lot of phrases about like, uh, and I forget the one about like luck is where opportunity meets something else. Um, but there's also the phrase, right? Luck favors the, the well-prepared, um, the heart, a, a good friend of mine, actually, um, Richard Grode out here, uh, been an entrepreneur, uh, was a, uh, was the MD for a couple of different, uh, accelerators, um, has this phrase, the, the harder I work, the luckier I get. And I'm a big, big fan of that one. Right. Uh, what I, I the way that I like to think about it is, again, I could not optimize for Jonathan recognizing that my weird email address actually related to dance music. And, uh, you know, I, I could have put that in front of 100 people and or a thousand people and not had that happen. But I could put it in front of a thousand people. Right. I could do that work. I could be relentlessly 
uh, focused on interacting with other people so that luck can happen, right? My blog log, I'll give you the much shorter version of that, right? You know, you know, Todd, uh, Todd and I had worked on, on the original version of my blog log, uh, for a year as a stats company for bloggers. And one day this random dude, like we didn't know him, uh, reached out Scott Rafer and said, Hey, I know this VC who's pissed about how we are frustrated or whatever that he has to go to MySpace to see his MySpace friends and six apart to see his six apart friends. Obviously this is a long time ago. And he's like, he wants, he just wants his like network to follow him. And he's like, you run stats across different websites. You cookie people. You could totally like build a distributed website. And we did, right? We are distributed social network and we did. And Yahoo bought us. And again, like I wasn't going to have that idea on my own. But because we had been talking to so many people and we had worked on this, eventually somebody in this case came to us. And the important thing was the willingness and openness to say, maybe we don't have it completely nailed. Right? That was <clears throat> what luck is being able to recognize the opportunity that is in front of you and say, oh, yeah, we should be doing that instead. There's this phrase. I, I mean, hell, I've got a website, obvious startup advice that all it is is blog posts about aphorisms that I use. Uh, but there, there's this phrase, uh, strong opinions loosely held. And it's sort of as, as an ENTJ, right, and the whole Myersburg thing, like that is the way that I live, which is I fervently believe something until the moment that somebody says, hey, I, here's, here's some other data. And I'm like, I fervently no longer believe that. I fervently believe this other thing. Let's go do that. And so much I think about being a founder is grinding and grinding and grinding until you get the new piece of information where you're like, oh, shit. Yeah, that thing. That's what we should be doing. I've got a, I've got a client and a really good friend uh, that pivoted four separate times on top of this core idea of a, uh, a, uh, a machine learning platform. And he just kept going into different industries trying to disrupt it and finally got into uh, licensing for online gambling. Hmm. Uh, suddenly like that's the one that hit. And he went from reaching out to like 17 different industries because COVID hit and killed his previous version, reached out to 17 different industries and was like, Hey, we've got this platform. We're open to building software, like anything you need. And what he found after, after in talking to 250 different people over the span of just a couple of weeks, what he found was, there was this real need in this certain plat in this certain industry that he had no previous experience with. It was like that. That's the thing. And within three months, he had had, I think he's got at that point, he had 17 signed LOIs and raised a $2.2 million round. Right. And now, now he's off to the races, building that platform to or building on top of his platform to support what those people want so that he can close the close that money. I was literally just talking to him an hour ago. He's my last client before this call. So wow. that ability to recognize the lucky thing that is in front of you and saying, it doesn't matter what I thought this morning. This is what I think this afternoon. Mm. Come on, Eric. There's, there's an interesting topic in there uh, that I think, I think is also kind of, not hidden from the startup space or from founders. Maybe we don't want to talk about it. There are some people that are talking about it on Twitter, but it's really around Eric. It, it's interesting. I, I personally have a belief that there's a life force inside of us. that's always moving in the direction that's best for us. And I understand that there's some choices in life, what we make that might kind of like put some dams up on that thing and, and it might back up on us. Right. And we're like, Oh, that's life. And we're like, nah, maybe it's you. But, but really it's like you, like there was this thing that was moving through you and like there was a direction and you chose to be yourself, man. If I could just, if we could just made it some founders, like just like literally just double down on being that uniqueness of you, like you, you having that email address wasn't a big deal, but it was actually you just choosing to be Eric. And in that, in that choosing, there was something that, that I think, you know, called the universe life force. It was just kind of like, okay, let's go this direction because he's, he's this right. And there's a little bit of that serendipity. I think we're afraid to be serendipity because you can't strategize it. You have to actually be here. And, and, dude, and look, look at me. Yeah, I look at you, dude. Yeah. That. Think of as a normal business coach. Yeah. I am not polite. I am bracingly direct as my friends refer to me. Um, and it works because it's, it's, it's me. 
Right. And everything that I do is with care and a desire for my clients to be successful. Like not everybody is, is a good client for me, right? Or I think a better way of saying it is I'm not a good coach for a lot of people. But for the people who I am aligned with, I am a great fucking coach. Yeah, because I have in the last five years really stepped into who I am. Mm -hmm. And it's somebody who is 48 and doesn't feel foolish about wearing rings and painting his nails and shit like that. Like if, if I was still like blocked there, like how could I be honest and yeah. honest about things that really matter with people? So I agree, dude. Come on, man. Mm. Eric, I'm, I'm curious to explore a little bit about the, the journey um, of, of coaching for you and, um, and you know, like the, the conversation Ryan and I were having before before you joined um, that, that I think you heard, um, I I have never actually you know used a business coach. Um, I've used a therapist, and um, you know I'm I'm married to my co-founder, uh, so we do a lot of a lot of coaching, um, uh, but uh, and a lot of feedback sessions. But I'm just <laughs> curious about what the what the experience is like. Um, who uh, you know, who, who, who turns to you as a client, um, what the engagement looks like. It's sort of, I'm just curious about sort of what, what that looks like for you. Oh shit. There's so many things in there that I want to talk about. Um, so, okay. Of all of those topics, the ones that really, really sort of, uh, get me excited. Um, I want to talk about how I get clients because again, it goes to sort of um, sort of Ryan's sort of statement about sort of like being moved forwards um, for the first. So I, I originally decided to be a coach as a side gig because I'd been starting uh, co-founding uh, another startup about two and a half years ago, Christ, almost three years ago. Um, and divorce is expensive and uh, startups pay for shit. And so I told my co-founder like, uh, Hey, actually back up. Um, a good friend of mine was like, dude, you need to stop advising. You need to start charging for this shit. And I was like, all right, like I'll give that a shot. Like I'll do that. Um, and so I'd started, I, I'd signed on a couple of clients and then, um, I told my co-founder like, you cannot pay me enough that I can cover my own personal monthly nut and cover alimony. So I need you to be okay with me coaching up to six people. There's some great benefits are a, like you pay me less B I will pattern match against the things that I'm coaching and actually see my own blind spots better. And he was, well, that sounds like a good deal. Just don't do it more than like 10 hours a week. And so I did that. And eventually, uh, April of last year, uh, first of all, uh, you know, with, with COVID I had co-founded a, a travel company. And uh, like many times in my past, my, my co-founder was like, I still believe in this. So I was like, I don't, I can't like, I can't do this. And so I quit. Um, and and um, secondly, I was just, startups are hard, man. Like, I mean, and I, I can tell you a different story a little later, but in a nutshell, let me just say that I am a product driven founder. And that means that every time I start a company, I am so emotionally wrapped up into its success. Right. And when it fails, I feel like I, as a personal failing, like I'm an awful person. And what I realized was I like coaching people way more than I like starting my own companies. Because if your business, if you're my client and your business goes out of business today, I will still sleep like a baby. Right. This is not my vision. It's not my dream. It's your dream. And you are paying for my objectivity. You were literally paying for me not to care in the way that you care about your about your startup. And so leaving starting companies and helping other people was like, I've got this emotional distance. So along comes April of, of, of last year. And because of COVID and because I left my own company, I was making like six grand a month. And that doesn't even cover alimony. And I'm like, got to get clients, got to get clients. And so I would talk to people and on like first meetings, I'd have this like, awful like grin like this look on my face like pained because i'm like can i ask for it can i like can i ask for them like can i ask for the sale like is, is, is it now is it now and it was uncomfortable for me it was probably fucking uncomfortable for them 
and it wasn't authentic. And again, like it takes me a while to get to, 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 to points, but to, to this point of authenticity, right? And this point of like being moved forward. And last year after the, uh, the whole, um, oh Christ, I can't even remember his name now. Um, the, the African-American gentleman that got killed. Um, the George Floyd. Floyd. <laughs> after the George Floyd incident, I just put on on, uh, on on LinkedIn, I want to talk to any founder, period, that's that's running a company, starting a company, wants to start a company, has a fucking idea for a company. Whether or not you need a coach, I don't care. Like, I want to talk to you. And especially I want to talk to uh, historically underadvantaged founders, whether that's founders of color, female founders, LGBTQ. I just want to talk to people. And it changed everything for me because I stopped worrying about closing people and I started simply trying to help. And now I actually tell potential clients, like, like prospects or whatever, I tell them I'm gonna do a magic trick. And I'm gonna do it like I saw it years ago in, in Vegas uh, when I saw Penn and Teller, tell me how they were gonna do a magic trick. And, they're like, and then we're gonna do it and your mind's gonna, and I'm like, yeah, whatever, bullshit. And then they do the trick and I'm like, I know how it's done and it still blows my mind. And so I'm like, I'm gonna do that with you because you wanna know how I engage, right? Chris, you asked me about that, right? And I'm like, at the end of the first phone call, I'm not gonna tell you how much I cost, how I work, fucking anything. If I like you and I think that someday you can pay me, not necessarily today, but you, like you could raise capital or like, you know, you've got a business that'd be profitable, whatever. If I like you and I think that you could pay me eventually, I'm gonna ask you if you wanna meet next week. And if you liked me and thought that I had at least some value that I added, you'll say yes. And I tell everybody this. And next week, if the heavens part and the angels, right, the choir of angels sing, and I feel like I fundamentally gave you value, I'll tell you everything. I'll tell you how much it costs because I'm not cheap. And I'll tell you how I work and all that. Odds are next week, I'm not going to do that. Like I'll give you some value, but it might not be the thing. And so if I like you next week, I'll ask you if you, I'll just keep inviting you. And it might be two months. And eventually like I might get bored, you might get bored, but eventually there's gonna come a day where I tell you the thing, I give you the feedback and I'm gonna know it and you're gonna know it. And I know that I could charge fucking anything. And in that moment you would say yes. And then from that point or from the point I am today, to the point when I'm there, the only thing I'm trying to do is week after week, earn my right to tell you how much I cost. Every day, every week, it's just fucking bring value, bring value. And eventually I will feel like I've brought enough value that I've earned the right to send you an invoice. Dude, my, Dude, life, my life, whether or not I'm charging somebody, I am helping them build their startup how could that not be the greatest thing to do every day? Chris, you know what that's like. Brian, you know, Brian, you know like. we are literally helping people create, you know, realize their dream. Hmm. Not a bad way to spend the day. Not a bad way at all. And 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 especially when, you know, the, the, the great thing about that is what you did was you removed the transactional nature of it until there's like a uh until 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 the client wants to engage right it's like okay eric I, I want you to keep coming back every week answering my phone call so let's get under a contract here right <laughs> yeah it's funny it's, there's so much power in, in in the other person having the choice right and 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 them choosing and uh it was funny I, i've got a couple of founders i work with and one of them was struggling with sales and, and closing i just can't close i can't close i was like what if what if you what if you just switch that word to i can't open right like I can't open. And, and like the next week, like the thing switched. Cause he was so worried about the clothes versus like, you want, you want your world open. Exactly. Hey, you don't want to close up. You want like, limitless you want to get this way. Not this like narrow. Yeah. It's old school, man. It's like an old pair. It's like a diction. I want to like create new words, like from this new paradigm that's happening. Like we'll do clothes. Now it'll be open from 2021 forward. And <laughs> but yeah, man, that's it, dude. I also, uh, it, 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 it goes along with, obviously, you've been a, a you know, tech stars mentor and there's this sort of good, give first 
yeah, you know, mantra. Um, it's it's actually we we do something similar with flat stack. We've always felt that um, you know the the five conversations that are just sales oriented conversations. Um, you know, we're like, no, let, let's just show you what we can do. So we do this, you know, test task thing, um, and, and actually do, you know, do work for free. And, you know, that's the way we sort of engage. Um, so I, I think that's great. I think that's interesting. So what, what are you, so, so with the coaching, how many, you know, how many clients do you have? Um, what's, uh, I'm, I want to get into sort of what you, what you work through with them. And if, if you see, you know, you talked about pattern matching, if you see things that are sort of points in their process, are they struggling with fundraising, product, strategy, all of the above, co-founder issues? There's so many things that, that you know, that you deal with. I'm, I'm, I'm curious at what you see. It's like being a startup therapist, right? It, it is a word that uh, I actually use with, with my clients. Um, and it's not my primary thing, but it is definitely a part of, of the experience. So uh, I work primarily with first and second time entrepreneurs who haven't yet established product market fit. Hmm. And like, two and a half years ago, when I first started like telling friends like, hey, I'm going to be a coach. They were all like, like, what type of coach? Like, how should I refer to you? Like, who, who should I refer to you? And I'm like, I don't know, like I'm a startup coach. Isn't that enough? <laughs> now it's like, oh, no, first and second time founders haven't yet established product market fit, right? It is a very specific niche of people. And luckily, you know, a lot of first and second time founders out there, most of them still haven't fucking figured out like what they're actually trying to solve and how to sell it. Mm. So, um, so that helps. M more and more, I'm starting to work with uh, companies that have raised A's um, for, for a different suite of things. But my sweet spot is still very much, you know, figuring out how to actually do something meaningful with, with, with your company. And so I have, um, as of uh, likely tomorrow, um, I will be again at my peak of 20 companies. I can't, I just can't imagine working with more than 20 companies. Dude, um, 20. It's a lot. Nice. And so, you know, literally uh, <laughs> Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I will have conversations from seven in the morning to six at night. I have one gap, one hour every day. Uh, today I'm chatting with you guys, um, but that's it. Like Tuesday through Thursday, all I'm doing is, is helping founders again. Fantastic. And we work on the way that I described is we work on a couple of core things. Uh, first of all, every, uh, every company needs their quarterly rocks. And if you are a more established company uh, that, you know, that could, and you've got a team of like six or eight executives, right? You're going to say all these executives have their rocks. And the company's got the big rocks. Nice thing about uh, about early stage companies that haven't yet product, found product market fit, their big rocks are a fundamentally established product market fit, build your MVP and go raise capital. Not necessarily in that order, but preferably in that, in that order, right? Like go find out from your customers what the thing is, what the problem is that they have, that you can come up with a solution that creates enough value that they would buy it. That is product market fit. Once you've established that, uh, go build your MVP, and while doing so, uh, go raise some capital. And oftentimes, a lot of my clients are like, "Hey, I built this thing. Nobody's buying it, so we got to fucking figure out how to uh, how to make this work." And I'm running out of capital. Great. All right, so we're going to do all three of those things simultaneously. <laughs> Additionally, uh, every week, every uh, every founder that I work with shows up and is like, "Hey, I had this thing this week." And sometimes it's, it's again, like I, if you think about like the EOS entrepreneurial operating system, uh, that would show up as an issue. And I was like, is this the most important thing to talk about? If so, we'll talk about this first. And I've got clients that literally like, I know what their big rocks are, but every week they show up and they're like, so this week I want to talk about X. Great. Let's talk about X. And it's funny because I have no, I literally, I sit down and I have no idea. And the dude's like, let's talk about marketing this week. Great. Let's talk about marketing this week. Let's talk about uh, how, you know, am I, am I spending too much or not enough money? Great. Let's talk about that. And other people every week, it's like, all right, what are we, you know, what do we accomplish on the MVP? What are the things that, uh, that we really need to establish in order to get people signing those LOIs, getting people to actually roll this out within you know, whatever world that they live in. And then lastly is founder therapy. 
And I've got founders that are phenomenal people. And you know, the, the big one is fundraising, right? Where people just feel like they're idiots. And it's, it's a common, sort of a common refrain. It's like, dude, nobody's good at fundraising. This is for everybody. And how, you know, how many times have you ever done this in your life, right? It's, it could be their very first time. And they're like, I, you know, I've you know, talked to like five, found, or five investors. I'm like, dude, you know nothing about this, right? Pick the thing that you think you're best at in the world. After, you know, when you've done it your fifth time, how good were you? And you know, let me tell you my stories of failure about this. And the whole thing is just to get people out of their headspace where they think that they're limited or that they stuck at it and be like, oh no, I just need to do this more. I just need to get more reps in and eventually I'm gonna figure out how to do it. And more often than not, all they need is somebody who's done it that they trust saying, yeah, man, we all suck. We all suck at this early on. This is the natural sort of hero's journey that you go through to be good at something. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, well, uh, Eric, I'm, I'm watching the clock here and, uh, want to see if, uh, either Ryan or I, or you have a final comment, but want to get you at least 15 minutes before your next client client meeting to, uh, uh, to grab a bite to eat or, or whatever, whatever you need to do. Um, Ryan, any, any final thoughts or final questions for Eric? Oh, final thoughts, final questions, man. We, I feel like we could talk for like two or three hours. So, um, I'm just trying to to uh, Thunderview and uh, a cook dinner again. All right, let's do, it, man. We'll we'll be back. I'm I've got some I've got some time. Uh, you know, I think um, I was trying to figure out a way to how to ask this question without your twenty the twenty people that you work with being like, hey, is that me or not? But are there are there one or two within your current group that you're like, oh, that's a really and you can't and you and are you trying to like give them like uh, are you trying to get them to the next stage? Or are you trying to get them to discover themselves getting to the next stage? Right? Are there one or two products inside of your inside of your ecosystem where you're like, that's a really good product. Like that, that thing is going to cruise, but, but maybe, maybe the founder hasn't seen it yet. Or, or like if there's a trigger there yet where it hasn't been pulled, what's something that's inside of like your current ecosystem of clients where you're like, I see it, but, oh, uh. I don't know if there's one where I feel like I see it and they don't yet. Hmm. There's a company that's really worth talking about because they much like uh, Rebrick that, pivoted multiple times and finally yeah. this. Um, there's this company, uh, Pavan Interactive. Okay. And they started out two and a half years ago uh, where they wanted that. So uh, one of their co-founders is this Cambridge PhD uh, with a, uh, with, you know, a, an advanced degree in computer vision worked on the Hubble uh, telescope and they use computer, uh, computer vision and machine learning to analyze uh, uh, competitive uh, esports uh, streams. Mm. Initially, they wanted to be a training company, right? Like just watch anybody's uh, gameplay and give them ideas on how to get better. And they tried this for a year and a half. And the problem was they, nobody in the company had any fucking experience like training people. Uh, nobody was even good at esports. Like they, they, <laughs> they were better than average, but it wasn't like they were like pro material or anything. And so we just, for like a year and a half, we just went around this thing, which is you're trying to build something that you don't actually understand how it works. And as we all know, software, all software does is make a process more efficient. And if mm. you've got a shit process, well, after software, you'll have a very efficient shit process. Mm. So COVID again hit. Uh, and it was like, guys, you got to just stop. I want you for the next three months to just go out and talk to everybody and ask questions. You don't get to sell at all just understand the problem, fall in love with the problem. And what they finally figured out was that, um, you know, if, if I can uh, basically uh, give their teaser deck is there are tens of millions of streamers out there on Twitch and YouTube and Facebook. And the, I forget what the Chinese streamer is, but there's tens of millions of people and they're all competing for, uh, for eyeballs. If you look at the state of streaming, it all looks like public access television, right? Mm -hmm. it, literally, if, if you want to up your streaming game, you go buy some LEDs, you get some cool posters, and you're throwing that shit behind you. Like that, that is the state of streaming. They're using computer vision and machine learning to actually watch what's going on in your stream 
and then provide overlays, basically being a virtual production team, just like you're watching Monday Night Football. And so oh, wow. you kill, and it gives you a kill replay. You, you have something where it's like you have five kills in under two minutes. They throw up this big sort of celebration, like five kills in two minutes. Um, wow. All of these different things. Today we were talking about this idea where um, they're going to start being able to read the text of people that you killed and start querying a uh, uh, Fortnite tracker and a uh, Call of Duty tracker and actually be able to put up the stats of the person you just killed. And like, and sometimes it's like, like, you know, nerf to, you know, nerf to nobody, like, boo. but other times <laughs> way, way more advanced than you. Again, another huge celebration, like, whoa, you just killed a badass. And all of that happens automatically. Whoa. That company is going to be worth a fortune someday. Cool, man. Where, where do we invest? <laughs> We're to uh, put together the next round. So uh, reach out to me. Wow. You know, it's funny, funny, Eric. If I don't I have I had a friend who was one of the first developers on um he was he was doing a lot of the UI UX on Twitch. And um <clears throat> I, I didn't know until I went into that world how big that world was. And then I was like, not just the Twitch world, but the 24 online, typically like Eastern globe uh world and i was like oh my god so um so i wouldn't i wouldn't say that investing statement if i hadn't if i hadn't kind of got behind the scenes and seen how you know i know it's big in the u.s but until you see the europe and the asians and like you're just like whoa it's it's really quite outside of my perspective yeah my uh my younger son uh has been a streamer for the last year and earlier that i guess over the weekend was like i heard that it's actually like Twitch does not have, how do you say it? He said it kind of came to this realization that Twitch itself is not really good for discovery. And so it's really hard to build an audience on Twitch. Yeah. And it's like, so what I've heard is that I've got to go to like YouTube and TikTok and all these other places and create content so I can pitch, all right, so I can move people, like get them excited to come watch my, my Twitch stream. And now I have to figure out like what content to create. <laughs> this, is what, this is what goes through, what goes through a six, or sorry, a 13 year old's mind these days is what content, content do I create in one place so that I can move them over to my Twitch stream? Right. This is, this is a generational sort of thing. Wow. So I am so excited for, for Pavan and I. Really here. cool. Hmm. That's amazing. Dig it. Dig it. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think Oleg's got a last uh, hot take. Let's 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 do, let's ask <laughs> okay. this, and uh, we can weigh in here, and uh, and then we'll wrap it at that. Um, are you uh, are you on Clubhouse yet, Eric? Uh, I I got invited a while ago. I used it once, and I deleted it. Um, I am very very uh, bearish on Clubhouse. Um, that said. I also uh, um, shared an office with uh, Uber when uh, when Uber was 12 people, and I thought it was the dumbest idea ever. So <laughs> like, my pattern matching can, in fact, uh, be very, very faulty. Uh, my concern with Clubhouse is that it is a very slow, uh, very low bandwidth uh, form of communication. And typically speaking, when you look at the uh, user-generated content, uh, companies that have been hugely successful, it tends to be with content that is very rapidly digestible because in order for people to continually create new content, they have to get social feedback. They have to get the woofies. They have to get the likes, the comments, and the shares. And when you think about photos, how many photos can you stream through in, in Instagram or you know old school Flickr? When you think of status messages like Twitter and Facebook, how many things can you scroll through in a minute and like, 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 share this thing, make a comment on this? When it comes to something like Clubhouse, it is a very slow sort of experience. And while I think we can you know, all sort of maybe lament the, you know, that we are no longer in a time where slow things that unroll over time, uh, where that no longer is valued, it's generally not valued. And I just don't think that once we get out of a pandemic, that Clubhouse is going to have an audience that wants to continue creating content every day. I think they're all going to go somewhere else where they can get more uh, more people. That said, Twitch entirely fucking proves my thesis wrong. So who knows? 
who, <laughs> who knows? Indeed, I, I, uh, you know, it, it'll be it'll be interesting to see. Um, but thank you for that comment on uh, on Clubhouse, um, Eric. It's been awesome reconnecting with you, having you on. Hopefully, we will get to do it again in person. Uh, maybe back at at your spot in Boulder. What's the name of your spot again? Thunderview. 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 <laughs> Thunderview. We we were we were we were having dinner with you watching the thunder and the lightning That's roll right. in, you know, yeah. so we know from whence the, whence the name came, came. All right. Well, uh, great to have you on Eric. Um, Ryan, really good to be with you. What perfect timing, perfect timing, man. Chris, he's like, he was trying as fast as he could to grab his board and hit the beach. So we'll let Chris slide on this one. All right, everybody. Thank you, man. We'll see you, Eric. Take care, Ryan. Chris, Bye -bye. if you're in this 